What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Imbali. We are in season four. My name is Helen Harimbi, and this is going to be one of my personal favorite episodes for you guys to see. The woman that I am talking to today is known to her nearest and dearest as a international woman of mystery. And to the rest of the globe, she's known as a pioneering practitioner who is now laughing, but she is known as a pioneering practitioner of the arts and music industry on this continent. She is Fiona Okumu. I've never heard myself being called a pioneering practitioner. I know, and I, I specifically chose the word practitioner, because it is the art of doing, right? Practicing. Yeah, and in everything, in every part of your career, you've been a doer. You're always doing. And that is how I would describe you. But how would you introduce yourself to somebody who doesn't know you? You'd say, I'm Fiona and? Um, and I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> that's, that's what the doing is all about. Um, and I love, first of all, thank you. That's, that's really, really kind. Um, to call me that pioneering practitioner, you know? Um, and the thing, that's the thing about pioneering or, or um, if anybody that's watching is familiar with my history, um, pioneering for the most part does not mean that you're kind of walking through life going, oh, look at me, pioneering, being the first or whatever. You're literally just going, doing, um, maybe opening that door to that room for the first time mm. and, and you almost don't have the luxury to pontificate and to think it through so that you can just kind of lose the nerve and not do it. Yeah. Um, and I think that's kind of the reason why it looks like I'm just pressing on. Yeah. But it's really just so I'm just like, I'm just holding on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. Okay, I think a lot of us are just figuring it out and seeing how we go. But the journey starts somewhere, right? You don't find yourself just figuring it out. No. So your journey begins in Uganda. Depends yes. on where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm starting from Uganda. Okay, so give me context of when your mom is pregnant with you. What is the family dynamic, mm -hmm. where is the family, what is happening when you arrive? Okay. Oh, that's a, oh, wow, that's, that's quite a question. My mom being pregnant, my mom being of this age, this kind of wide age that I'm in, you know, my professional life, this is literally where my mom was um, when I was a baby. Right? What does that mean, this wide age? This wide <laughs> age of, like, accomplishment, I guess, okay. or progression. Um, so I'm, I'm just thinking that but by the time my mom had me, by the time my mom had me, or rather, I'm at the age where I, I would have had one, two, three, four, I would have had all of my six children by now if I was my mom. Mm. Um I have no children <laughs> at all. Um, you, you have many artists I, that you children, have that you have seen grow up that along. It is <laughs> such a ripoff of life. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but just starting from where I, I began, um, when I was born, I was born in Kenya. Actually, I was born in Kenya, um, and I was born in the eighties. <laughs> In the eighties, <laughs> and you know, I was I didn't stay very long um, in Kenya. We very quickly moved to the UK. This is where I spent the first, uh, I guess, the formative years. So, like the nursery school, the first year of primary school, um, and all of those things that you, the first things that you experience as your child, as a child that is significant. That that fifth birthday party, that boy Adam across the street that liked me and mm -hmm. I did not like that 
You know what I mean? Oh no, was he ugly? Thing, like, yeah, no, no, no. There was one. I have such a vivid memory of this, this boy uh, on the playground that really wanted to kiss me every single day. Um, and I, I was not down for that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and now that I think about it, I'm like, Adam, you really shouldn't have been doing that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't a good it idea. It wasn't a good Mm-mm. idea. However, damn, in my 20s, I could have used some <laughs> Adams. <laughs> Where was the Adams? Where were the Adams in your 20s? Where was the Adams then? Um, but yeah, so, so the UK was very much, and I, I only mention this because it will come up again later in my life, but that was very much a part of like my formative memories. Um, and only when I went to Uganda, this was like, I guess, almost pretty, like prepubescent. Um, this is when I, I, I experienced Uganda for the first time. So primary school, mm. living for the first time, as I as I remember it, in a, a non-nuclear family setting. So this was the first time that we had, um, I remember my dad was a lecturer at the university, um, Makerere University in Kampala. Mm. And my dad, <laughs> my mom rather, my, my, my mom had three, four, three, four siblings that lived with us in mm. his three bedroom flat. And two of those siblings had children. These are my cousins. So there was literally, a, in a three bedroom space, there was about 20 of us. You know? Wow. Yeah. I remember that um, very, very, very distinctly. And I just remember that being like very definitive of how I see um, family, um, communal living, and all this kind of thing. This is literally where I learned um, one of my greatest passions, which is kind of opening a home up to people, mm-hmm. whether they just want to hang out or whether they really need it. Um, so again, it was, it was that thing. And my mom taught us very much how to, and the reason why we lived the way that we did was economic circumstances. My, my family comes from a tribe that is like we're northerners, right? Um, and in Uganda, that means that if if your tribe's person is in power at the time, mm-hmm. life is good for you. Yeah. If not, it sucks to be you. And this has not been the case for our family for like years and years and years and years, right? So... living in this house, doing what we were doing. Um, so that was, th- that, that's my early memories of like how I kind of came to form the kind of values that I have. I did, I never grew up. I never had my own bedroom yeah. living, um, in this space. I never had my own personal space, um, living there. So I, I sometimes feel like that might be an explanation why when now that I'm much, much older and able to navigate the world and have the means to do it. I don't really like you, you know, you won't find me being very, I'm social mm. when you know me, but like, I don't really look for it. Yeah. Um, it's almost like I've, I've very recently discovered what it's like to be in your own house, in your own quiet, in your own, like what your fragrances and scents and like what your kitchen feels like by yourself. So for me, um, living in a nuclear setting and as, as an adult has only just started for me. Yeah. Um, all my life, it was just, it was family, cousins, sisters, everyone, everyone in your face, in your space. All the time. That makes so much sense because in general, you are someone who enjoys your own space yeah, and so. you don't mind to be alone. Uh, so. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. But you, you mentioned that your dad was a lecturer when you guys went back to Uganda. Mm-hmm. Is your mom also from Uganda? Yes. So, so how did you find yourselves in Kenya where you were born? I believe this was where my dad was doing a teaching practice. Okay. Um, I can't remember what university it was, but it was in Nairobi. Um, and that was the thing, again, I think without really realizing it, my dad instilled in us uh, an itchy foot. 
Um, not that he, not that we went to so many places together, mm -hmm. but even given the fact that we were not so well off, we were never a rich family, but we went so many places. Like I do remember us driving to Tanzania and driving to Kenya when we're in Uganda, um, which in the, at the time, you know, it's, it's quite a distance. It's you know, in the 90s. <laughs> in the 90s. <laughs> You know, it's, it's it's far. We're not flying, and you know, we we live we're staying in like really run down um, motels whenever we go. You know, to, on, on that long journey or whatever. But again, I feel like these are the things that kind of informed how I've conducted my life as an adult. Now I travel a lot. I like to be in in different cultures at the same time. Um, and I think that came from that, even though that was never the intent. It's so funny because this was, these are the things that our parents were doing to try and settle us. Mm. But what I got from it was that I like to kind of be everywhere. Yeah. But one place. Or oh, I liked. Yeah. yeah. Not so much anymore. <laughs> so Kenya, uh, kind of your birthplace, yes. then the UK for your formative years, you come back to Uganda mm -hmm. uh, for primary school, mm -hmm. and then you come to South Africa for high school. Why? What Why? happened? Dad got lucky. All of these, every single bit of movement for the first, I guess, 12, 13 years of my life was just because of the opportunities that my dad was getting either as a you know, like a postgrad student or as a lecturer or some kind of like, you know, Scandinavian NGO putting money into something that he, so he was a professor in English, mm. um, English literature. Um, for some reason that got him a lot of, I don't know why, I need to find that out because you know, you don't hear that these yeah. days. Yeah. Like, what did you study? English. Oh, I don't travel <laughs> the world now. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't do it now. No, 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 no. You barely make it out of your town. But my dad, he was, um, he moved around quite a bit. Um, and also, like, and that was the thing, because when we came to South Africa, the first place we landed was Mabatu. Mm. Which, in the Northwest. In the Northwest, yeah. which is, you know, Mabatu. It, it has a history. Right now, it, I, I, I haven't been there in years and years and years, but like, it definitely was the place where. You know, Mutsuako wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the Mafi Gang boys and, you know, like Stone from Bongo Muffin. I remember him being however many years ahead of me in high school. Yeah. But he was in my high school. Um, that was quite something. And did you ever ask him about the Tarantula? <laughs> no? Didn't come up in high school? <laughs> no. Well, he wouldn't have done it. He would have done it. It didn't exist at that time. But you should ask him when you see him really about will. the tarantula. I really will. And the thing is, and here's, here's the great thing about high school and school and, and, and the leveling effect that adulting has. Because in high school, Stone was obviously like, you know, the god. Like he was the coolest, the ultimate. Like he could dance everything. The Bobby Brown, the Michael Jackson, the MC Hammer. This guy was everything. He was good looking charismatic, dressed well, danced well. Dancing well was always a weakness for me. I mm. don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> but uh -huh. I love a nigga that can dance. So that was, um, that was my attraction to Stone at the time, I guess I would say. Um, he never looked at me once. <laughs> you were also like a baby to I him, was, right? So... But like... <laughs> I wasn't in this <laughs> But what kind of what kind of kid were you in I high was, school? Uh, in high school, very very good question. I was so not cool. Yeah, I had absolutely no dress sense. Mm -hmm. I remember again, and and this is this is the thing about moving from one type of society to another, which is both are African. But both are so very different from each other. So me, I was coming from Uganda, which is very um, conservative, very, very, very like our Christian values over and above everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, at that time, I wasn't even really allowed to wear trousers. Oh, wow. Yeah. So when I came to South Africa, they 
I just remember that high school and that high school, Mabatu High School, which if we ever did like uh, a TV series, like how they did backstage, I feel like Mabatu High School really should have that series because mm -hmm. it was that. It had the intellectuals, but it also had the, the kids. Did you ever watch Fame? It's yeah. from before the 90s. <laughs> Yeah, I know, babe. You see, people are going to watch this and be like, why do they keep mentioning the 90s? It's an inside joke. Don't I'm worry. So sorry. <laughs> but yes. anyway. They make, she makes the 90s sound ancient. Yes. It's my favorite I era. It's my favorite that. era. Anyway, um, so what I was saying is that Mabatu and, and, and that particular school, like there were, were cool kids there. Mm. All of the cool kids were there. All of the brainiacs were there. And then there came me, you know, very lost uh, culturally in the sense that I was just like, holy shit, I come from a very strict background. Mm -hmm. My parents, like I literally wasn't allowed to do anything at all. But I know at this school, they have discos. Mm -hmm. They go there and then they dance with boys and they kiss and they do all of these things. None of that shit was happening to me or yeah. for me. Um, and I also just remember never having, um, like, you know, I don't know if you guys had this in high school where you had a uh, casual day, civvies yeah. day. Right? Yeah, civvies. I hated civvies day. <laughs> Why? So much. <laughs> Why? I didn't have good clothes. Oh. Yeah. So I was like, just let us wear the uniform. <laughs> It could all just be the same. Yeah. Because when I wore the uniform, now I just felt like, yeah, we could all now talk at a level and I'll just charm you with my dazzling personality. Yeah. But if I have to, like, I never had the LA gears and all of the things that those kids were wearing at the time. No way. Not only did we not have that inclination, we just didn't have the money mm. for it. So it was a bit of a torture for me. Yeah. So that was one aspect. I was awkward. Um obviously far more um optimistic more innocent as a child i was very um book smart yeah until a certain point and i i almost remember it being that point being this confusion where it was like how come all these kids are cool and i'm a nerd and none of the boys want me <laughs> And, and, and I, I remember that also being the point where I just, I wasn't even killing it in those grades anymore. Like, yeah. Oh, this, this shit doesn't even really matter. Like, because here's the difference when I was in Uganda, that was an accolade, right? When I was like, cause I was always top three in the class. Mm. Fiona, yeah, number one. Nobody cared about that. In my bad. <laughs> no. No one cared. So it's like, oh yeah, all right, whatever. There was that. Um, so what? What was I? I was I was curious. I was awkward. Um, I was hell. I mean, I guess all teenagers are. I was hella confused. Um, and were you writing? Yes. Okay, tell me this about is, you writing in high school. Thing. So there was a high school newspaper, which. Oh. <laughs> what was it called? Oh. Mabatu. It was. It, the high school newspaper. And it was called the high school newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> Mama to high school newspaper. Oh. And what did you used to write about? Everything. So I wrote about music. I used to invent my charts. Mm -hmm. Like, this is the best song. This is the second best oh, song. Oh, wow. <laughs> So, so give me a, a picture of what your chart looks like. What what year is this maybe that you started? Uh, let me give you the, the, the chart for 95, the best mm -hmm. year that there ever was. Whew. You know what number one is going to be. Brandy's number one. <laughs> I thought you were writing about South African things. Was no. it just, oh, it was just your music taste. Yeah, my, okay. this was the high school newspaper. You must understand. Okay. That name alone mm -hmm. shows you there was not a lot of quality <laughs> control. <laughs> so Brandy for you was yes. at the top. Always in the charts was mm -hmm. Brandy. I did, that was my understanding of charts. Charts are the songs that are the best at a certain <laughs> time. So these are them. All Brandy. All oh, Brandy. <laughs> I don't, I don't think that worked well. Did it work well for other people? I like, never, ever looked for feedback. This was oh. the most interesting. 
<laughs> I didn't care. I never thought about, okay, we've produced this paper. Guys, how do you like our... It was always like, we've done our part. Yeah. Yo, do you like it? I don't care. Do you not like it? I've already done it. There's nothing we could do. But that was that was my, my stance. But you were enjoying it, right? Very much. So, so did you enjoy it to the point where you were like, I'm going to go study this in school or... Because you didn't wind up studying journalism. That's a fantastic question. And I, so often I have thought to myself, like, why didn't I do that? Why didn't I? Because I ended up going to Rhodes University after that. and Which is known for journalism. Which is known for journal- the best journalism in Africa. But you went and studied. This is how I decided to study university. Um, I couldn't study medicine. Why not? Do engineering. Couldn't do. Well, I just didn't have the grades. Didn't I let those grades go? I wasn't that academic, and the way I was deciding where I'm going to study wasn't even logical. It was literally like I just want to not be because I'd been in Mabatu all this time, and I didn't want to go to Unibo, mm-hmm. which was the, the the local university. I wanted to go like how all the other kids were going to go out of town, go and study in Johannesburg, go and study in Cape Town or, or whatever. And and then by some miracle, uh, Rhodes accepted me. I definitely remember my grade not being that amazing. Oh, wow. It wasn't good at all. I was just like, they took me? Shit. What do you care? I'm a girl. <laughs> you know? But it wasn't great. It wasn't great. And, and, and that was a very shaky foundation on which I built my academic career which absolutely went nowhere so what did you study at Rose? i studied economics oh <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> i studied economics i studied psychology i studied accounting um i ended up studying psychology but not because i i chose it at first it was just like you know when you need a course for credit mm. this is what i did it's like um and a little bit of anthropology i don't know People, I didn't even know people still study anthropology. Um, so that's that's how come I ended up. That's how I, I made my academic decisions. It wasn't intentional. There was no plan from the beginning that I'm gonna do music. I'm nada. It was literally like, oh, I like newspaper. Fine. I think what it was was that I was never um, conditioned to think of what I was doing in the newspaper as a career. It was mm. it was fun entertainment. Um, but what I did at Rhodes was I never went to school once. <laughs> you didn't go to class? I never went to class. I went my first year. Let me not lie. Yes, my first year I was killing it. And I was, my first year, I was very much like that Ugandan girl that was a baby. So mm. I was good. I was, you know, my attendance record was amazing. I, all of that first year. Second year, oh my God, this is when I discovered alcohol. This is when I discovered boys again. I was so confused, second year of uni. Um, but I just don't remember ever thinking of all of those things that I enjoyed. The other thing that I did was I I went to um, Rhodes Music Radio mm-hmm. one day. And I just was like, oh, wow, there's a radio station. I didn't even know that there was a radio station at that. That's how clueless I was about Rhodes. I just knew that it was a cool university. A lot of white people go there. So maybe that means that. And this is how you think in South Africa. If a lot of white people flock to it, there might be some 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 quality there in terms of the education. Cool. Um, and then also... Um, yeah, it's it, it looks like a lot of fun on the brochure because you know you, you get the yeah. brochures, everything looks amazing. I was like, oh rag, roads, this, oh cool. I was convinced, but not based on anything that was scientific or academic or logical. It was just that this is where I could end up, this is the best place I could land ten toes down, right? Um I went to the Rhodes Music Radio one day. And, and showed I, them your brandy charts. I did. I was like, guys, <laughs> I am not, he- I just, I'm hearing this guy, whoever is on right now, he, he hasn't called. <laughs> I want to be down. I'm confused. <laughs> What's happening? 
<laughs> no, seriously. I went there and I honestly did not expect anything good to come of it because it, it, it felt very much like that version of school where it's like the cool kids are over there and I get to sit over there. And, it, and that was always fine. Um, and I, I thought this was going to be another version of it. But then it was like was this guy, Chaka, was there. He was like, yeah, no, Zimbabwean guy. You know, we broadcast 24 hours a day. And if you're ever interested in, you can do some graveyard shit. I was like, yeah, I can do some graveyard shit. <laughs> okay. And I did. I ended up doing some graveyard shifts. And graveyard shifts became, um, you know, it became like daytime radio. It became primetime radio. It became... Um, I also moved into like music management, not station management, music management there. And mm. I think this is where I really solidified um, the fact that I was going to work in the music entertainment business somehow, but I didn't, I still didn't know what it was. Yeah. I also learned how to DJ. And this is where I met clubbing DJ. So this is, I, I started to DJ like house music. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's a departure from yeah. R and B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, but it's the easiest thing to learn in <laughs> DJ. There's four to the floor; you can never miss the beat. <laughs> so that's what I started with, and then I moved into like R and B and hip hop as a specialty. But I miss those days. Like I, I feel like um, you have to love music to be a DJ, mm. right? And I haven't DJed in a while, so I, I, sometimes I feel like maybe one day. I'll go back to that just so I can become a civilian again. When when Corona's over, when we'll have we'll have the real yeah. going away not, party for Corona. Uh, Goodbye, Corona. Not the false alarms. Oh no. God, yeah. So when you were DJing, um, did you have the same alias that you had when we would hear you? <laughs> Break that down for me. Did you have an alias? What do you mean? You were DJ Watts. <laughs> Case. No, for real. Uh, for real, for real. I'm so embarrassed. I was DJ Fine in the end. I did not like that name. Why? Now, Where did you get it now from? Now I don't like it. Then I thought, wow, that's that's amazing. It's from the 90s. You see. It's from the 90s. <laughs> Who gave you the name? <laughs> <laughs> and you just I, went with yeah, it. I was just like, yeah, my Nubian sounds about right. It's Fiona, but I'm Nubian. I'm a Nubian princess. <laughs> Gosh, do you remember when that was a thing? I do, <laughs> I do. So now, because I think this is a good segue to get into when most of South Africa and the rest of the continent hears you on record. But before we get there, a few things happen, yeah. right? One of the things is you finish school and then you decide you want to work in a bank. Yeah, so it's not that I decided, it's like this This makes sense, this, you've learned, you've earned it, and I was going to like, start investment banking as my thing, and I think, and this memory just gets vaguer and vaguer because it, it, does, it didn't make any sense, but I, I, I must have trained for six weeks, mm -hmm. and then the one, the, there was one the other day, I was just like, you know what? There's literally no point. And here's the thing. It's like, I used to have to travel to, I lived in Pretoria at the time. This is a, so this is all after high school, after roads, after everything. I'm back in Pretoria mm. trying to figure it out. Um, and I would have to commute to Johannesburg to work. Didn't have a car. Wow, that was a struggle life. But I just remember that I was just like, if I'm going to go through such a schlep, to make a living then let me do something that I feel matters mm. and I don't know why at that point that didn't feel like something that mattered yeah and maybe it's just the fact that I knew that I was not going to commit to it um so I just knew that everything that was happening in that space was just a waste of time or whatever but like I just I just knew that at it didn't feel like this is where I'm meant to be. Um, so I, I didn't, and I didn't even have another option. I was just like, I'm done with this. This is not who I want to be or where I want to be. Um, and then um, Rage, I heard, were hiring. And Rage were 
you know, Maria McCloy and Zeno and all of them. And they were blowing up. Like they had really just kind of started, like kick-started youth culture in South Africa. Um, they'd been doing it a few years before I left university and whatever. And when Maria let Zeno know, and Zeno, Zeno then spoke to Zubs, whom you know, Zubs, uh, I think Zubs and Zeno, I don't know how they know each other, but Zubs and I were very close in uni. Um, and Zub's so like, yo, you you, you want to come and try this? Because he was already affiliated with them somehow, being a rapper or whatever. I was like, okay, I'm going to come and try. Um, and when I came, really what we were doing was we were doing scripts for Channel. <laughs> channel, do you remember Channel? Yeah. Um, so we were doing that. We were like, this was the first time I had ever written music scripts. I had ever, uh, like anything to do with making money, uh, for a music service, aside from DJing, because DJing, I made good money in mm -hmm. university. <laughs> I almost remember, like, I'm saying, I'm going to fail tomorrow. I'm going <laughs> to fail, but I'm going to be so balling right now. Um, but, um, yeah, so, 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 um, we were writing those scripts and it, it, it was literally Maria saying to me, so when such and such candy or whomever, is then you have to do an introduction, you have to do this, you have to do that. And that's kind of where we got, I got into the, 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 the pattern of writing to a brief, writing for a client, etc. So I did that and then there were other little jobs and, and you know, Rage were really great at being resourceful in music. It's so ahead of their time because everything was potentially a, a, a hustle like you can make money out of it which is not a it's not a way that we tend to think as Africans like we quite uh, in a box when it comes to what's possible as music entrepreneurs so I will always look back at that and think while wow, these guys were also and again like if you ask them it's not as if they were deliberately being pioneers or whatever mm. but they were just like this feels right let's do this let's make this let's and also just also being very um um i guess globally in tune so they had a lot of like foreign templates that they borrowed from different types of production companies Zeno is but Zeno was my mentor yeah for the longest time and he was just really good at being like oh so you know what that jam did in in the 80s <laughs> uh, like, yeah no, no, but like, yeah, you know, so they, they were quite good at inventing the wheel for this part of the world. And yeah. To this day, I just really feel like there's a big, there's a giant hole in the space of, um, of music and youth culture that is the shape of, of rage. And yeah. I, I still don't feel like, and, and not that it has to happen, but I don't feel like there has been anything prior or since that has been as valuable for this culture, just telling the whole world about what is happening here. Yeah. Um, and that could be for any number of reasons. I feel like uh, music from South Africa, quite early, that was the last big headline, right? Quite was the last really, really big. And, this is, and I'm just thinking about this, like from a, like, foreign coverage point of view. Like, so the last thing I ever did for the BBC and whatever was like when we did, um, what was it? 10 years since apartheid. And mm. we did something with, I don't know if you remember that. Um, we did, we did, we did a little radio documentary for, um, for BBC One Extra about that. But I'm just thinking like, since then, I don't really see as much um, coverage on the South African business as a whole like every now and again like, oh tom is cute i'm a piano is cute but it's never a whole like you're not seeing the stories of the like i should know everything i need to know about vocalistic mm. in that epic and grand way that we know superstars right and that's yeah. that's really disappearing quite a bit and i feel like that's because we just don't have those types of platforms anymore um but you were basically writing the scripts for Channel O, but you were also now contributing to Rage.co.za. Rage.co.za. And Hip Hop Head and Rush. And Hip Hop Head Rush. 
which I should speak about actually. Hip hop head rush was invented by Mass Dosage. Mass Dosage was, wow, well, Mass Dosage is, is a, nobody ever, no, no one ever asked me about this, but he's actually the guy who brought me into the journalism of hip hop. Um, a white guy. I, I believe he grew up in like Bryanston or whatever, but like the most gentle and smart and loving and principled man I ever knew. Um, and I actually met him at, at, at uni in Rhodes and he was actually, we ended up in my final year, we lived together, myself, mass dosage and another guy called um, Justin. Um, so the joke was that we were all DJs <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, the setup was hilarious. It was like a three bedroom house, but our landlady was on the property. She lived above us and it wasn't a good time for her because <laughs> mass dosage with the hip hop, Justin Schwartz with the house and then me in the corner over there with the R&B like <laughs> every day practicing in that house. Everybody's smoking weed. Everybody's in their zone. They can't hear her screaming, can you shut the music <laughs> down, please? That happened a lot. Um, but Mass Dosage, you know, he was so committed to a certain style of hip hop, which I feel was very, very um, kind of prominent in, in, in Johannesburg mm. at a certain time, um, the 2000s. Don't know so much about the 90s, but the 2000s, there seemed to be like, I, I feel like South African rap was very led by a certain kind of, um, it's not even a traditional, like we, 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 we were definitely textbook rap, mm. um, uh, audiences. Right. And, and, and for that reason, like, so New York rap was really influential in South Africa. Um, I like you remember when the Talib Kweli's and the, the that that movement to this day I feel like even now even in in a time when rap has really changed like we don't rap now the way that we did 15 years ago or whatever but like South Africans are still very lyrical yeah. in how they rap compared to everywhere else a on the continent but even like say if if we you take a nasty c to any where in America, they'll tell you that he's very informed, a very classic style or classic school of thinking mm. of hip hop, um, even though he's not, you know, he's not old, you know, but that, that was a thing. Um, so I don't even know how I'll come with this point. <laughs> We're talking about hip hop head rush. <laughs> and really what I wanted to know about that is at the time you were putting together articles about people like DJ Bionic yeah. and really putting on people that you were seeing in your day to day yeah. at 206 or whatever. Yeah. How was your writing, would you say, changing or influencing how artists move at the time? Because now there's someone who's writing about it. That's a good point. And I actually remember being the first person to write about Squatter Camp. Um, <laughs> I don't remember that story at all, Yeah. but I remember what that made them feel like. Mm. And I just remember Sia saying to me, I didn't know that people do this in our culture. Mm. You know what I mean? Sia, you know, obviously is a, is a man of the world. He knows. That's the, slicker to everybody yeah. else. <laughs> Sorry. Slicker. Slicker. Um, <laughs> Yes, Slicker from, from Squatter Camp, you know, that, that was my connect. But, like, I, I didn't, um, at the time, again, I, I didn't take notice of the fact that this was a, a, a new thing that we were doing. It just felt like the thing that we should be doing at the mm -hmm. time. And I definitely remember Squatter Camp making that kind of, like, shouting that out. Like, wow, it's the first time we've ever been written about anywhere. This is amazing. And I was just like, oh, my God really wow because i just thought that this is something that that should be happening anyway yeah uh, did it put a like a weight on you like now it means something to people so you have to now take it more seriously or move in a different way no never and maybe it should happen <laughs> <laughs> maybe i would have pulled my finger out 
Um, but I, I, I definitely, I mean, I wish I had thought about it then. It, and again, it's, I, I keep coming back to the point that like you just don't know. Hindsight is twenty twenty. You only know after the fact the kind of effect that you're having, the yeah. kind of legacy that you're potentially leaving behind, um, whether you're fucking up or you're not. And I, I never ever, and that's the thing, and that was a sweet spot for me. I never felt that kind of pressure until way, way later. Yeah. At that time, I literally was just like, it was, I was curious it was fun and it was what we were supposed to be doing. And that was the beginning and the end of it. Um, it's when these issues started to happen, like when you're now many, many years later writing at a fader and at a guardian and, 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 and that's when your thinking starts to get a little bit more political, but yeah. those honeymoon years unrivaled, certainly some of the best, creative years of my life for sure. yeah. just because I wasn't thinking about that yeah so you were also I mean you were writing but you were also still fine Nubian and you so uh, <laughs> you appear on the last letter mixtape so <laughs> you <laughs> why does this thing not die so you and Zubs are the first employees of um, oh, Black Rage Productions and of course, he becomes this incredible rapper that we know. Yeah. But you are on this mixtape. How does that happen to be like, listen, I'm going to do this mixtape and you must be on it. How does that happen? Oh, such a bad idea. That was Zubs. That was totally Zubs. And let me tell you about a dream deferred. Mm -hmm. now, this, this story has never, ever been told. I'm going to tell it to you today. So um, there was a time... In my 20s, when I came at a fork in the road and I really wanted to know what the next thing to do was, I did feel that South Africa was great, but the kind of culture reporting that I was interested in, there was no real appetite for it at the time. And that's part of the reason why I thought, let me just go and see what happens in London. And it's so... Again, like I say, it's only when you know a lot that you get crippled in how you think. When The less you know, mm. the more free you are and, and somehow the better you, you know, the better you can do things and, and the more you can get things done. So that at the time when I was thinking about, oh, you know, I should, I should go to London, I wasn't ever thinking about, oh, um... You know, London is really expensive. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or that, how am I going to live? Or and, and those are real things in London where just by leaving the house, you automatically spend £10 or, and upwards, right? Yeah. Um, when we were, when I was in London, I was a freelancer, of course, but I was also, I was also doing like part-time temping, admin work. <laughs> I did some bartending work as oh, well. Oh, wow. I bet you didn't know that. No. <laughs> Let me tell you, the worst bartender in this world. I know, because you are a Prosecco <laughs> girl. Your drinks come in one, like, there's no mixing. There. <laughs> it comes straight out of the bottle with you. I honestly think it was just the grace. You know, it was just the fact I was working in suburban London. Not even London. It's like South, South, West, West London. It's where my family lives. And there was a pub there where my, my, my cousin used to do, like she was a chef. And so I would go there every now and then just to have, she's like, you're not doing anything. Do you want a job? Do you want, do you want money? And like, yeah. She's like, okay. Debbie, can you just put her behind the bar? <laughs> and let me tell you, have you ever tried to pull a pint? Do you know what no. you do? So to pull a pint... That's why I don't even know beer. I don't know how beer is supposed to be, but it's like when you're supposed to like tilt the glass to an edge and then pull a lever so that when the, you know, the, the, the foam is... does it. Yeah. Yeah. I got, I got you. This would always be the glass and it would always be 80% foam, 20% <laughs> beer. But people would have to pay you the full me. amount. <laughs> That's crazy. Mm -mm. <laughs> they loved me. They loved me. But I just remember that 
it was a it was a weird thing that I did when I was that you know at, at that point in my life, and I was able to be like I do this to make the money. All of the other music stuff, I do it because it's enjoyable and mm. it's my purpose, and and it's 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 a very interesting realization now because I'm just like I don't know why I even thought that. Oh, I do know why, but like it was just a constant separation of like purpose and 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 fulfillment and whatever being just completely separate to making a living mm. it was always always at loggerheads yeah and it's only just kind of now starting to coincide a little bit um better but i i, I definitely remember that being a thing um but i want to go back to this story <laughs> um what was the question again? So that I could Zubs, the last <laughs> letter mixtape. How did that happen? Because that happens before you're in London. Yes, it does. But it also happened. So it ha- the recording happened before I was in, in London, but everything that happened afterwards, I was not here. Mm. So I didn't see, I didn't see Zubs performing that mixtape. I didn't see Pebbles on that stage. I didn't see them going to Pumalanga. Like, this, this is just a lot of things that I started at Rage that I never saw the end of. Yeah. Um, for better or for worse, was great. But in terms of Zubs, how that happened was I was just like, okay, I'm going to London now. Um, and the reason I went to London was two things. Number one, I was suffering from something super personal like a heartbreak Mm -hmm. so running away from that number two a very very hard lesson um with lauren hill okay i don't know if you know about this no tell me yeah so i was doing it wasn't my event it was not even my event so my best friend at the time mela melanie and bradley they did this event. So that's Hypers and DJ and Bionic. Hypers and DJ Bionic. Yes. <laughs> this event. It was called Black August. Yes. And Black August, the, the, the original intention for Black August was Lauren Hill was the headliner. Mm. And everybody else was going to be there. And that was Talib, Black... And again, this is the thing that makes Johannesburg so special because... There was no other place in Africa or even in the world, like even in America, I was just like, there was no, like Black August was a big deal to us. That was not a fucking thing in America at yeah. all. Um, and then, as you know, things went from shaky to absolutely unsavable. And this is when Lauren Hill disappeared from this event and sponsors pulled out. Um, and long story short, I think at the time, what we should have done as kids is we should have just like thrown in the towel and said, sponsors aren't on board, so we are not on board. Mm. But we didn't do that, did we? We just said, right, how do we make this happen? (laughs) (laughs) With nothing. Mm. And, and even at the time, even Benza was a partner. Yes. Yes. And so we, you know, we begged, borrowed and stole quite literally money from everyone we could think of. And when that event happened, it was such a contradiction because it was on the one hand, like seismic shift culturally that that event was something in history. Like I, I, I definitely remember when Zubs was on that stage, when Tandiswa was on that stage, when Everything happened. I also remember being at Metro FM and bursting into tears because I had taken Black Thought to the radio station. And on that very same show, he was saying, oh, promoters are sucky and we are... Oh, really? It was such a badly communicated event because even within... You know, after... when, Like I said, when we, when we decided to go ahead with this event, what we didn't take note of was the fact that we needed the money so that the artists could live the lifestyle that they're used mm. to and not two, three huts, like star hotels in, in Santa and, and what have you. So, so they just kind of, I think they got the impression that we you scammed them. them. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they thought. You scammers. No, we did it. 
So now you're at Metro FM crying, crying. and they can see that you're crying. Yeah. Or were you hiding or what? So, because I was literally outside, all the way outside the building. He okay. was inside and I was in the car, the caravel. <laughs> it was a caravel. Caracar. Caracar. <laughs> listening to that interview. And I just remember Black Thought just going off and I just cried. And I remember Suede. I don't know if you know Suede. Mm, Suede. Suede was right. This is the first time I ever met him. He was right behind me and he was going, oh, what's wrong, soldier? <laughs> and I was... I what's in- wrong, soldier? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to start doing that to people. What's wrong, soldier? <laughs> it was horrible. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, so that yeah, yeah. then leads you to go, I'm out of this country. I'm, I'm done. to go and learn how to do this thing properly. Okay. That was the plan. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like your, your stories are always so interesting because so many things have happened. happened in order for you to even get there. Because by the time you're doing Black August, mm. you have already been named deputy editor of YMAG. Mag. I forgot about that. Yeah. So when you were basically poached, right? Because I guess they were seeing the work you were doing with Hip Hop Head Rush, with Rage Dalsio Radzere, and you were asked to come be deputy editor of YMAG. Mm-hmm. And when you arrived, Rude Boy Paul was the editor, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And then he left and then Lee Kasumba mm-hmm. was the editor. Mm-hmm. But you were the constant mm-hmm. there. So what was that period like? It was weird. It was weird because this was, it was not the, it was not the Yona Kiyona. Why, you know, hmm. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't the 99.2 why. It was certainly moving into the next. It was the why which was now a lot more commercial. Mm-hmm. Um, with a few people in leadership who were a little bit more, um, you know, they had access to things. So for me, I just felt like the, the, the period that I was at why wasn't as rosy as far as history, you know what I mean? Because people like to remember why for being that monumental, historical publication that I joined after that peak. Okay. I joined after that peak. And I feel like, yeah, we did some amazing things. I think this was, this was the era where I think I believe this was the first time we put an American on the cover. So we put Ludacris mm. on the cover. What was the decision behind that? The decision behind that was Ludacris was slamming at the time and Ludacris was very invested in Africa at the time. He still is. Yeah. How have you know? Um but it was it was literally that. It was he was here often. Um and we had never done it before and it was also just facing the fact that um national pride and globalization don't necessarily have to cannibalize each other. Like I think it's it's very healthy for us to find our face in the world Um, yeah because we often do this thing as africans or african cultural practitioners is like the african section the other section Mm. which we know why that's happened but i also know why that can be pretty disadvantageous and i even face that today um simple things like programming like i'm I'm always in two minds about like, yeah, let's put more, more women on the platform and then we create the woman's place. Mm. I really hate that. Yeah. Um, so I, I say that because I, I, I remember a specific voice of dissent at that time. And I even remember who said that. Who? Who said it? Who said it? It was, uh, it was uh, Ziki. Um, Mazai. Yes. And Ziki Masai was like, oh, why do we have Americans? Um, And I told her, I was like, well, because we, hip-hop kids, love a lot of things. Mm. And a lot of those things are American things. And I feel like if we can come to a place where we can balance out local representation and international and reflect the appetite, I don't think we're doing anything wrong. I mean, that did it there anyway, but like, I, I definitely faced that. But it was also the highest selling magazine cover of wine magazine ever. Wow. All time. Yeah. Which lets me, it, I always, always, even today, think about like, what does that, 
really mean? You know, what does mm. it mean? What does it mean when we look at things like streaming charts, actual streaming charts? Not the brandy Not chart. The, brandy <laughs> chart. the streaming charts, if you look at, um, and I don't want to call out competitors, but like if you look at, for whatever country, a Kenya, a Uganda, a Tanzania, a South Africa, and you look at what's the top streaming, if you look at Nigeria, I guarantee you there's only two American artists in the top 100. Mm. The rest, six whiskey albums. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's an interesting thing, and I'm, I'm, I never really know what the explanation for that is or, or, or why why that is and whether that means that we Nigerian or not we I'm not even Nigerian <laughs> you're honorary Nigerian like I'm not even honorary anymore <laughs> oh you are you I, out I, I, I got kicked out but you know I always wonder I don't know if that means that I don't know if it means that we have less of an appreciation of what is local or not or or no, or, or maybe there just needs to be more people on streaming so that we have a better representation of everybody's te- tastes or whatever. I, it's it's just something that I I I, um, I play with in my mind. But mm. as far as Zubs, now Zubs and I were both on the radio in at Rhodes, mm-hmm. big big radio voices. Um, quite popular for that reason. He was also a club DJ. I actually beat him in a DJ contest. I oh, really? He never tells anyone the story, <laughs> but I won. Michelle Constant was the judge. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I won, I won a record bag, even though I didn't, I didn't DJ uh, record. Vinyl. Like, never have I done that. Mm. It was always CDs. Um, but that was a great time. That was great. Um, in any case, so the, the Zub story was that he was like, yo, we should totally do a radio show together. And I was like, yeah, we should, totally should. And we took that idea to our bosses, you know, Maria, and they loved this idea. They mm-hmm. loved it. So we made a demo for any radio station you could imagine. It's Metro, it's Kaya. It's, and, and this is what I mean when I say radio are always trying things. It yeah. All the TV shows that they ended up producing or they ended up um, uh, hosting or presenting was because they actually actively came up with them. It wasn't because they people went looking for them. Yeah. Um, and so this would have been another one of this. We'd done all of the lot. We'd done um, TV. We had done ter- like uh, digital TV. We hadn't done mainstream radio, even though we'd done a few bits and pieces. So I used to go into Glenn Lewis's show every Friday mm. and do like a little like roundup of inter- an entertainment oh, roundup. Yeah. Days. Can you remember that these things used to happen? <laughs> yep. What were we doing with why we had internet anyway? <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> this happened, and obviously, I mean, I'm here now, so obviously the demos never went, anywhere, <laughs> but. <laughs> is one thing that happened. So when I left for the UK, it was quite an intentional decision. I was like, okay, I have to go and learn how to do events properly. And the heartbreak. The heartbreak, right? And um and, and I remember deliberating and I remember even as I was leaving, uh a friend of mine, an industry friend of mine, he needed to go to the UK for two months or so. He was the producer of Glenn Lewis's show. Mm. And he needed to just kind of be offline. So he was like, listen, I know you can. You can stand in in this position and you just never know where it's going to go. Yeah. And I was like, I really want to, I would love to, but I'm going to England, right? And... Remember, this was like the dream job was, uh, has always been radio. Mm. And they then were like, okay, cool, fair enough, that's fine. And so, and so who did they get there to stand in for the stand in? Azania. So, I so Azania there, replaced you. Uh, and, and, and she then went on to become a radio host. And, and sometimes I'm just like, oh my God. 
Had I stayed there, would that have happened? Would I then have become Metro? Because that was your dream. Often I think about it. Well, red free, red free. At, at least we have you as Fight Nubian <laughs> on, on the mixtape. Oh my God. But um, you know what I found interesting, right? Is that you said um, the thing about the charts and how in Nigeria, it's mostly Nigerians listening to Nigerians and that kind of thing. Because um, when you went to London for that five years that you were there, you were basically putting on music from this continent to territories that might not be yeah. open to it. Yes, yes. And that seemed to be a very deliberate thing that you were doing. Mm -hmm. So where did that come from? It came from knowing your lane, you know, like kind of landing upon a niche. And, and the other thing I always tell people is that, yes, I'm now known for being the African plug or whatever. That's not how I started. That's mm. that, I always tell people Afrobeats is a very, very, very new thing for me. It was R and B. I was writing yeah. about Brandy for the longest time. Even when I had first moved to the UK, remember, I so when I got there, I was quite privileged. I very quickly came into a circle that was in that world. Um, I had a DJ friend who introduced me to an editor of um, New Nation, which was the biggest black paper in the UK and mm. that at the time was a thing it doesn't exist anymore it makes me really sad because the UK needs that but when I was now a writer for New Nation it's, it was an interesting dynamic because in the UK there is press and then there is black press okay right and because black people need black press no matter how not up here we were we always got the big interviews mm. so i it was the greatest training i ever got for learning how to speak to artists and getting stories out of them this is where i i interviewed um oh i have another one a great one for you. i interviewed um rihanna i interviewed rafael sadiq i interviewed at the time my favorite hip-hop group of all time uh de la soul um I all of it. Any mm. anyone you can think of, all of the tiers, I I got the opportunity to get in front of them and learn how to do it there and then. Still super grateful for that opportunity and still that just kind of remains something that I have kept with me, like because I know somebody man, somebody put me on, even though I they had no business doing that. Mm. They did that and so I'm quite intentional about making sure that and especially like black girls, black writer girls, my passion for life. Like if I know that they can do something creatively and there's a bag for them somewhere, like this is, this is what I love to do, right? Because someone did that for me. But all of that to say, I learned so much in that role. Um, and the reason why we ended up doing that mixtape the way that we did was just because it was meant to be something else before. It was you know, supposed to be a radio show. Yeah. And then it became that thing. Yeah. yeah. So you keep coming back to this mixtape. You keep bringing it up, yeah. not me. Because what I <laughs> asked you about yeah. is um, your intention to put on African music so in inverted in commas foreign territories. Nobody else was doing it. Mm. So no one else was doing it um, and there was an interest in it um, and it's a sad thing because even to this day like we just don't have enough we have them they are there they exist but we don't have an abundance of people who do the work of telling the stories of African artists producers labels no, and that that's that's to do with the era that we live in. We live in, I mean, the blog the blogs got killed off by the, the gossip blogs, really, right? That's what happened. And then social media came, and then nobody cared about reading a story anymore, right? That's what that's what they say. So why I ended up writing those stories was number one, those artists, a lot of them became my friends. Um. And like with all of my friends, like I think everybody just has so much to say. Mm. Um, and, and 
it doesn't make any sense to me that I mean, what, what do we really know about a whiz kid, for example? What do we really know about a David or other than he's really rich? Or what yeah. do we know about Bernard other than he's amazing and he's quite stroppy? Or, you know what I mean? Like, we just, I, I feel like we don't do it enough. And that is because of where we live. You know, the economy that we have doesn't support creative industries. But um, more than anything, I, I just... That was it. It was just it. It wasn't a, a, a whole thing of like, oh, look at the Africans. And it, it it was, but it wasn't. It was we just ended up there, and that was also similar to the way that Afropop came about. Um, here and that's Afropop Mag. Afropop Mag. Afropop Mag was uh, Yolanda, Sangreni, and myself. And <laughs> so weird because we weren't even in the same country. She was in the U.S. Mm -hmm. I was in the UK. We were both doing our dead end jobs, whatever. I think this was, I had left the bartending by then, <laughs> but I was doing admin. For yeah. The council. <laughs> <laughs> I loved those jobs because you know why? They really didn't expect very much from me. <laughs> you were just skating by. <laughs> you were, but also for good money. Mm. Like, those minimum wages of the UK, it's like, yeah, six bucks an hour. I can live on that. Yeah. I work 40 hours a week. That, yeah. Don't eat dinner like maybe four times. I'll, <laughs> I'll make it. Um, so it was it, it was a great experience. But yeah, Afripop came because she and I were like, yeah, we're not going to do the sexy things that we want to do at these jobs that we're doing. Mm. So let's just, I don't know, if you see something, just write it down. And when I see something, I'll write it down. It was organic as that, as untrained as that. Our first blog posts were flippin' horrible. Like, I'm so glad they don't exist anymore. They were just bad, bad, bad writing. You know, WordPress. Yeah. You know, WordPress when it was that long ass yes. scroll. Infinite scroll. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With the brand WordPress. That was us. Um, and this was about the time when there was a really amazing community of African bloggers and writers. Honestly, like people hate Twitter now and people hate, like, oh, but I, I have a, a very, I'm, I'm quite attached to that medium because mm. this literally, literally, this is where some of my best friends today, this is where I found them. It's like a dating site, yeah. but for a certain kind of like people who think like you or who would like what you like or whatever. Um, and, and I remember this was the time when OK Africa's were being born. This is the time when every other blog, which now does not exist, so mm. sadly, this is the time. And it just felt like there, there was a moment that we were all like, hey, in Rwanda, hey, my best friend in Kenya. Yeah. How are you? And literally, every morning, I could not wait to be like, you know, when you used to greet your followers. <laughs> <laughs> Morning, Twam. Yes, Twam. <laughs> We but you know, it. like what's interesting about what you're saying is at its height, yeah. every pop mag was serving two purposes, right? It was doing your passion yeah. of basically putting on women who are writers and giving them some money to do that. I was one of those women. Um, and then you were also basically... I five bucks. I mean, I needed it at the time. Oh. <laughs> um but the other thing is that you guys were basically putting on for the continent and the diaspora. And you guys, I think, had like 3,000 unique impressions uh, a day, mm -hmm. like by year five or something. Mm -hmm. But you guys didn't make it to 10 years. You made it to nine. Mm -hmm. What was the reason why Every Pop Mag shut down? The reason why we didn't even shut down. And even now, I cannot tell you that we had a day of like, announcing departures and whatever. I'll tell you right now, um, my colleague and my, my partner, Yolanda, who is, that she's the matriarch of Afripop. The, the, honestly, she's the GOAT. Um, she is now just a big girl at NPR. Yep. yep. NPR. She's killing it at NPR. That is my dream organization. Yeah. Anything. Like I love public radio, but I love 
that format. And I love like this, if, if I was ever to work in radio again, that's where I would be. And so, she's there. So I'm just like, so I'm sort of there. Um, so she's doing that. And I'm, you know, I'm at Spotify. Um, so what got in the way was real life. You know, it, th- those publications, we never got anybody to support us. Mm. Um, we weren't, say, uh, I'm trying to think of what was a comparable brand. You know, it, it was different to something like OK Africa, which had investors, and yeah. we had people. And it was literally myself, Yolanda, and y'all trying to make the thing work. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was beautiful in that sense, but it was also very difficult when you are getting older and you have to pay mortgages and Mm. you have to pay for flights and you have to pay rent in London and New York. So really, it's not that we left. It's just that we just had to live life. Um, Okay. I'd give anything to bring it back, honestly. I I still feel like there there is a place for it in the world. There's a place for so many like it in the world and it it must happen. Mm. So in all of that, right, everything we've discussed so far, you became the the supreme connector, right? Like you, I think OK Africa actually called you an artist amplifier. I so love that term. you went from like I'm writing for people to like I'm really championing artists, mm-hmm. and you said it wasn't intentional for you to be this African plug. But over the years, it became something you're super deliberate Mm -hmm. about. So where was the change and how did that then lead to you joining Apple Music? Yeah, that change comes from being in diaspora. This is this is where you really and it's being in diaspora, but also that thing that happens to you when you. Thirteen, you know what I mean? With that, you really matter. For me, anyway, I never, ever, ever thought about things like that. Um, I guess I, I just took it for granted because I was in Africa the whole time, right? But when you go to places like New York and when you go to places like London and it just becomes so almost like, like a, it's like redundant almost the way you have to keep emphasizing, not only am I a black person, black woman, black woman, from this country, from this tribe, of this thing, of this, like, you know what mm. I mean? Like, just to make sure everyone understands that this, this is not a monolith. We are all very different. And this is, this is my accent. This is my little flavor and respect it. Yeah. You know I mean? Or at least know that it's there, but don't, don't try it, you know? So for me, I think that the coincidence, the coincidence was just the fact that I was coming of age. And, and, and identity was just becoming that much more important for me. And also the the opportunity, like nobody was doing it. Yeah. Nobody was doing it. I knew how to do it quite well, quite easily. Again, like I said, because somehow I, I ended up knowing who these people were, mostly mm. guys. Yeah, but these are skills that you've honed, right? Whether it's eventing or writing or whatever. But then you move to a tech company and it's Apple Music and iTunes, but it's still a tech company. What was that transition like for you? Yes. So I started with Apple Music as a freelancer. Mm -hmm. And it was the most bonkers thing ever, like... I just remember thinking to myself, okay, so you guys are going to give me however many dollars to make a (laughs) play. Have you seen my charts? (laughs) (laughs) I just whipped some up for you. So that was Mabatu High and Fai Nubian (laughs) coming together. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? That's why I mean, everything always, like one foot leads the other. It's always been like this for me, but I started as a freelancer because of the 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 the, the reputation of, of Afripop Mag. And in there they then asked us to do like a like a official curation yeah. for, for Apple Music. Um, so we did that. Um, and then a f- couple years later the position became available to do label relations and editorial for Apple in Dubai. Mm. And I said yes for the simple fact that I in as much as I wasn't intentional about 
of where I wanted to work. I did know that one of the things that has propelled me forward is being an early adapter and knowing that, okay, so playlist curation is obviously the currency of this music industry. I better just kind of situate myself in that world. Mm -hmm. Only way I could do it is that the biggest tech company that exists, that was one. Um, and number two, also just the, you know, I, I just became cognitive of the fact that I was in this very position of being able to choose a job at Apple because I started a blog, right? And that was by being abreast with tech. Mm. So I just knew that from that point onwards, it would only, I could only advance in that way um, and maybe just bring humanity to uh, technological advancement as as a as a as a career progression tactic but like i i now know that whatever happens i must always factor in okay how's it going to look in two years in three years in five years etc yeah the technological landscape of everything yeah. yeah. And I think the, the three years that you spent there, for me, it felt like there's a definite black person in the room. <laughs> and it also felt like there's a person who cares about the continent and not just the four countries on the continent right. or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering, why did you not stay there then? Why did you feel like, actually, I'm going to go to, to Spotify? So it was simple. It was very, like, it was literally just the fact that... Um, they were going to be headquartered in South Africa from the beginning of 2019, which I wasn't ready to do just yet. Mm -hmm. Which and I, and that decision really, really, I, I remember it was like this time two years ago, and I just remember almost feeling ill, going like, "You're going, you really, you really, girl, you're you're really just going to let go of the most." valuable brand in the world mm. just you don't feel ready <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and then your answer was yes <laughs> <laughs> and that was my answer so i didn't go yeah yeah so what is your title at spotify right now um i'm the lead for label it changes all the time it's artist and label artist and label partnerships lead for africa Okay, so when people see Nasty C billboard in Times Square, Nasty is that because that. of you? Nasty C did that. <laughs> so, Nasty so what is your, uh, what do you do now? You know, like literally for 20 years, you've done many different things within music and in culture. Yeah. Nowadays, what do your days look like? What do you actually do? It has, it, there have been many different things, but I think that the theme has always been constant. I've always been advocating for the artist, mm. always and always and always. And so that's what I do, whether it's a tactical thing, whether it's a strategic thing. Um, so it's a simple thing as me going, oh, nasty C, can you send me your pictures for Friday's New Music Friday so we can okay. do this on whatever? Or it's me going... Hey, uh, Def Jam, so let's, what's happening with your rollout? Let's do this in New York. Let's do this. In, like it's, it's, it's anything as high level or as operational as whatever you imagine it to be. But the focus is always the advancement of the artist. And in this sense, because obviously I'm, I'm employed, right? In the corporate sense, it's advancing, uh, it's, it's advocating for the artist within uh, within the building basically yeah. yeah and i think we can all see the difference i mean i was telling my dude the other day that like we literally see spotify everywhere <laughs> like and spotify african people everywhere Do and you? that's that's a, a lovely that's thing awesome. to see you know um so you and your team are doing a that's great fantastic. job um really but i wonder if you remember doing an interview with afrilove.com in yeah. 2011. I don't remember the interview, but I do remember Afri Love. So they asked you, what do you, what, what do you want to be doing in the next 10 years? Why did they ask me that? <laughs> Whoever knows that answer. <laughs> do you remember what oh, she no. said? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you what she said. Okay. Um, 
what you well, said. I was not going to say I was going to be with five children. That I know for sure. No. <laughs> 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 so you said you, you're going to be running your live music diner somewhere in the world, in London, Accra, or Nairobi, <laughs> maybe even a franchise in all three, but it'll be hot. It'll be hot. You've got one year to make that happen. Corona. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess I'm not going to ask you what, what you want to be doing in the in next 10 years. years. No, <laughs> but I do want to ask you what is your deep desire that you still want to do? Because you have mentioned radio, radio. and I know somehow <laughs> you will come back to radio, but is there a thing that you're like, you know, money notwithstanding, corona notwithstanding, this is what I want to do. This is my deep desire. Yes. There's a few things, actually. That diner is still very much there. Okay. However, I tweaked that dream. I want it to be... The reason why I want that diner is because I love to cook. Unfortunately, I'm not done cooking now, but I'm really good at it. Uh, I love to cook and I love music. And I mean, you know, the, the two together are just obviously like the obvious kind of bedmates. In the UK, I did this thing where I stopped going to the club when I was living there because I just got tired of Like, I don't understand people who go to the club not to have a good time. You know what I mean? London is full of those types. So we started to do this thing in my house, which was like every three months, mm -hmm. we had the most incredible party in South London. Wow. Every three months. And that for me was almost like, it can because I would, I would do the, like a real, there was real food, like real stew, real rice, real, like real cause African people. You're not going to give them sandwiches. So I would cook and I would have actual DJs like myself and other guys on the decks. And, and so in a way that happened and I realized that that dream is not a profitable dream. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm protecting it. Mm -hmm. It still lives. Um, but what I really want to see is way more black African women in the music business mm. and I'm not talking about video vixens or I, I, I almost don't fight that fight anymore. Yeah. They're like, Oh, you have black girls. I'm just like, I want us to fight for the other things, which mm -hmm. is I want the black A&R girls. I want the black managers. I want the black CEO. Like this is the only way. One of the reasons, one of the challenges that I have at the job that I have now and the one that I had before was just the fact that when you want to program, you want to do something and you want to make sure it, like it's that whole thing of like, oh, look at this list. Mm. So many dudes. And then you start doing that exercise, don't you? Yeah. How about so-and-so? Oh no, she's not this. Then there's that. Like that, and the reason why that happens is because none of us are on the back end. Mm. That's the only reason why. Yeah. We don't have even, we do not have a woman whiz kid. A woman, David O. How is that possible in I mean, the Africa? I guess someone like Tua is, is, not, is the person that people think is. of as, you know? Like, I mean, the first time I saw Tiwa on a cover of a magazine was, I think, Rolling Stone. And you had written I that, that. That was like 2013. Can you imagine? So I think she's the one that comes closest to like a global superstar. African pops star that is female yeah we're so far from the goal man we're so far we need to and that's the thing it's like i, I almost feel sorry for women like tiwa because you almost feel like because there's nothing it can go either way you either have to beat all of the things and mm. it becomes confusing or you just kind of like okay this is this is the only thing i'm going to do and I'm going to be true to me, but what that means is I'm never going to be a star. Mm. You know what I mean? Because there are only stars when there are so many different options. Yeah. Right? Whiskid has risen to the top. There's so many mediocre and... There's levels you to You know what there. I mean? Like yeah, yeah. It's, it's just like there's so many... It's, it's, I just want the balance to okay. make sense. Like, I know a bunch of girls... 
I will put you in contact. Yeah. But this has been an amazing conversation. Um, I don't know if you uh, ever watched uh, my Imbali with Tandiswa. Tandiswa. Um, and she tells a story about Busim Klonga because people are always like, you guys, you yeah. know, so close and yeah. whatever. And she said, like, she felt like she was the most important person to Busim Klonga whenever they were together, oh, right? Okay. And what she realized later in life was everybody, everybody felt like that. Important. And I think you have that quality too. Like, anytime we are together, I feel like the most important person. Oh. And then I speak to other people and I'm like... <laughs> She's told that. What? <laughs> no, but I think that's, that's awesome. I think that's a great quality to have. And from people like me who are not artists and superstars and all of that, to people like Tiwa who's told me, remember I made that video yeah, for you. So like video. how how people feel, how you make people feel. That is incredible. Uh -huh. And I think more than what you do in your career, I want to say thank you very much for who you are. And Imbali is about flowers and giving you your flowers while you can still smell them. Oh. So we really love and appreciate you. Thank you so That's much. Just <laughs> Thank you. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do. I don't think I've ever seen you cry, oh, actually. It's Aww. <laughs> All these years that I've known you, I and I've know, never no, seen no, you. I, you. Nobody gives me flowers. That's why. But you definitely, <laughs> definitely you. deserve them. Oh. And I have no doubt that the things that you still want to do, you are going to do. And anything you need, I'm here and I'll, I'll help you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't even know what to say. <laughs> it, there's nothing more for you to say. It's for me to say thank you so much for watching. Uh, my name is Helen Harimbi. We have just made Fiona Okumu cry. <laughs> but <laughs> it's been an amazing episode and we'll catch you on the next one. Thank you.